Okay, so today is November 28th, 2021, and this is our Western Desiderata meeting. And for this meeting, um, did you, uh, how should we start it? Because I know in the last meeting, you talked about a few topics already, like the sigil and about the new uh, variant. So uh, how should we um, continue this one? Um, does anybody want to say anything on those topics if you look in the topics and post it on Reddit? Um, we discussed them long session, long session this morning. Um, so the, they were the, the sigil, and I just mentioned to people, just I don't think it was clear what I had in mind, but what I had in mind was that Everybody thinks up their own ceremony that's just meaningful to them and it's personal. Uh, you go in, on the 21st of December, you go and do it, and then just record it with a phone or something. You know, nothing special. Don't need full camera lighting and the whole film crew. You just uh, just do a selfie even and just, just say what you did so we can all share it. So the idea is you do something personal and we all do it at exactly the same time so that we all know that we're doing it at the same time and you kind of think of that as you kind of connect in your mind that we're all doing it at the same time and then um, so that you feel together doing as your own separate thing and then you share share it on the day after by just posting it on XRMed and then we can all enjoy whatever any of us did um, but you can go crazy if you want, do a big thing or do something very simple, just do a token thing. Um, the, it's an experiment uh, you'll see in the previous meeting. But yeah, um, yeah, there was a, a, a few, a bit of consternation that it was a bit too woo-woo. Um, I did intend it to be a kind of a, a woo-woo thing. Uh, it's an experiment to see what we can actually do in terms of an egregore and not be online. So if you do, you see, you didn't want to do a big like Zoom or Jitsi meeting where we all get together and do it. I didn't think that was the right, the right thing to do. I think it's much better that we get into the spirit of basically being connected without any digital connection. You just be kind of connected in spirit. And I think that triggered a bit of a reaction in terms of a little bit woo-woo. Um, but, and then it led to discussion of the intersubjectivity synchronicity telephone, all of that kind of stuff. Um, but all I can say is I would like to experiment with that and you and see if we can actually, you know, summon some demons. <laughs> um, and do a bit of woo-woo stuff. Yeah. Because um, it's out there, you expand your mind and you... Uh, you'll see some of it, even get a bit gaslit if you do it properly. So, yeah, it's it's good from so many angles, but it is an experiment. So let's just see if if uh, if we can pull it off, and then you know, take it from there. See what we do. Could do other stuff, but yeah, make it meaningful, personally meaningful, and then just share with everybody else. So that was that. Um, did anybody want to say anything about it or have any questions? I do have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Yes. Yeah, so when you said we will be, we will, we're planning to do it at the same time, that doesn't mean synchronous at the exact time. You're just saying that on the solstice itself, um, because of the difficulty of, um, uh, you know, we're all dispersed around the world, and um, if it's daylight there, it might be nighttime here. So just doing it oh. on the day of the solstice, right? I was thinking, try to get it to the minute. So if it's too much trouble, or you have to get up at an ungodly hour or something, don't do it. But I think it's 10.58. So the solstice is a time, it's the same for everybody around the world. Okay. The, the solstices are 15, 15, 15, 15, 1559 UTC. Thank you. 1559. Yeah, so, so, yeah. yeah, so it's kind of early morning in the West Coast, I guess. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's 
do, do, you know, if if you you don't have to nail it exactly if if it's too much of a, tr a chore, but the the idea is you actually nail it on the minute. The um, and you know, then you're aware that everybody else is doing exactly the same thing. So it's in other words, we are all in the same room all around the world. <laughs> It's a way of actually meeting and just being distributed around the globe. I'm for it. I think uh, we need more rule in our lives. I think there's so much uh, drive for ultra rationality, especially for um, those of us who are working in the fields of science or engineering or um, computer programming. Um, there's a lot of logic and rationality already. So I would appreciate more woo-woo in my life. Yeah. Yeah, well, that was the pushback we got was from it's not rational enough. And uh, I'm saying, well, yeah, but, um, we must stay rational. You don't want to go off the beaten path too much. But, you know, on the razor's edge, it should be, it should be both. You see, because if you if you open minded enough, you can start to see all these other things that are actually irrational. So the, the world, the majority of the world, by far, is irrational. I mean, just mathematically, the irrational numbers. Although we only know of a handful, we know for sure based on Cantor's proof, Cantor's diagonal proof, that the the rational irrational numbers outnumber the rational numbers by an infinity. So the rational numbers of might as well not exist. They're so <laughs> they're so uncommon. Even though there are an infinity of them, the they're, they're a, a small sliver of a bigger infinity. So it's like rationality doesn't amount to a clock of beans, but a whole society is based on it. If you open the doors to irrationality, um you can be misled, and that's a bit of what we were talking about this morning. So, yeah, without you, you don't want to be misled uh, into macchio, and and uh, so, so there is bullshit out there. I mean, it doesn't mean everything's permissible. Um, so it's again, it's on the razor's edge. It's something you see. Uh, you see, there is this thing which Dicky Dawkins, who's probably one of the crustiest rationalists out there um said so, you know like uh, you don't want to be so open-minded that your brain runs out and he said well dicky dawkins is one of the close closest minded people i've ever ever heard of <laughs> so you don't want to be that rigid either so dicky dawkins is not even close to open-minded he's a dogmatist of the kind of like michael sherman all those guys they're going to stay stuck in their little cocoon. It's and it's not very safe. They think it's all safe and it's rational and it's deterministic and it's also a very dangerous place to be because the world is going to go irrational shortly, <laughs> and they they're going to be left with their hands in the air, going like, "Oh, woe is me! Why is the world going nuts?" You say, "You know, get with it. It's nuts town. <laughs> it's Chinatown, Jim." <laughs> And you're gonna, they're not gonna survive Chinatown, is what I'm gonna say. I will put money on that horse. You want to bet me that all these ultra rationalists, Dennis and Dickie Dawkins, and all of these guys, it's like, oh, when the crazy time comes, and I mean, we're in it already, it's gonna get a lot crazier than now. Uh, they ain't gonna shape too well. They're too rigid. They they're gonna want want a big sleep is what they're gonna want. They they want they're gonna want out. When the, and they they're gonna want out just when the fun starts. So, yeah, but, but but the the caution is valid. Is is you don't want to go do lally. That's you know, that's not cool either. The the wolves are gonna get you if you go too lally too do lally. So yeah, so. Yeah, li listen to the thing this morning, and that's yeah, that's kind of where where it was at. Um, I'll tell you a little story about about Jung and rationality. So, so I think in a lot of ways, Jung thought irrationality rationality was the 
the problem, the disease of our time, and I think so too. Uh, basically, he was his metaphor for the what I call alien cortex. Um, and um, Jung was kind of trapped in his profession because he was very mystical. His his mom was a spiritualist, and so he he kind of was a guy who a shaman who realized that you know his profession was actually insane. But, but he couldn't, you know, he was Lutheran, I think, or Calvinist, and he, he was trapped in that, that ultra-Orthodox world, very stuffy world. And he, all, all his career was basically to try and break um, <clears throat> them out of the ultra-rationalism of this Teutonic mindset, um, because he knew it led to stuff like fascism, and First and Second World Wars and stuff. So, but... Um, he had the so so this is the, the the kind of feel of some of the woo stuff that certainly I've seen. There was a very famous South African guy called Lawrence van der Post. I've actually mentioned him. Lawrence van der Post, I mentioned him in, in terms of the Seed in the Sower, the um, David Bowie movie, the uh, Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence. So that that's a true story. It was uh, Lawrence van der Post's experiences in a Japanese prisoner war camp. Uh, Lawrence from the past was big pals with with Jung, and very woo. <coughs> a, a lot of Prince, he was associated with Prince Charles. They said he was Prince Charles's guru at one stage <coughs> in the eighties. Uh, Prince Charles got a lot of flack for for being associated with Lawrence from the past because South Africans have have a very large capacity for woo. But, <laughs> because living in Africa, you know, there's dollops of woo, right? You, you, you know, you, you kind of uh, the Enlightenment, say in Britain and stuff, is kind of, you kind of think it's the the rule, and uh, you know, you have this progressive narrative, and every everybody's getting going towards the light, and um, you you think of this kind of intellectual bastion of being the right side of history and all this kind of bullshit that liberals tell themselves. In Africa, you don't have much of that sense. You have much rather have a sense that that rationalism is a little tiny flickering candle in the darkness and could pop out at any moment. It's more like Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. So you you know you kind of rationality is just hanging by a thread in Africa. Uh, so you know that uh, gives you a bit of difference of why why South Africans have plenty of time for Lawrence from the past, and why you know people in Oxford sort of like give uh, Prince Charles a lot of flack for being associated with somebody that's so flaky. Now, the association that Lawrence from the past had with Jung involved a lot of incidents that were really kind of supernatural, and I've seen a lot of that stuff myself, and and. You have. I know the path to get there, and I know that when you come back, and you have to deal with the fact that rational people cannot go there; they're excluding themselves by not opening their minds. So you have to expose your woo-woo stuff to rationality. You have to exhaust every normal experience before you can really. Uh, okay, this is really supernatural. But the more you do that, and the more you convince yourself that there really are things that are inexplicable you will see more of them. And it's not because you're kidding yourself. Uh, you, you have to make absolutely sure all the way, be like a ruthless science to make sure you're not kidding yourself. But uh, I just warn you that you will see some things if you get far, further down this path. So here's the story with, with Jung. He had, a, he tells a one patient, he was a young girl and she was stuck in her alien cortex, like we all are really. And you know, she he couldn't make any progress. She she you know she was undergoing psychotherapy because she had a lot of problems, um, and they were all due to her rationalism. Um, she would be considered pretty normal case today. And, you know, such an ultra rationalist in those times, I think, was abnormal enough to treat. Um, but she wouldn't pass comment. I don't think today. But anyway, um, she was like a real Michael Shermer, and so. Everything she did, she could do the house down on rationality and stuff. And so she would do her own analysis, go through her, mo her motives, tell her Jung what she and Jung couldn't, couldn't penetrate this fucking intellectual facade that was everything was normalized, rationalized, analyzed. 
and she was just stuck in in this. She was she was bright, very academic, and she had this kind of fascination with Egyptology. So she would go and interpret her own dreams in terms of Egyptology, and she eventually got stuck on this one icon of the scarab with all its implications in Egyptology, rebirth and transformation and stuff. And so uh, one day, she was in therapy in Jung's, um, in Jung's office, and um, you know, while she was going on, man and man, <laughs> Jung was getting completely bored. He, became, he suddenly noticed that there was this tapping at the window. There was an incessant tapping, you know, duck, 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 duck. <laughs> and so, you know, he got up and went over to the window while she was still rabbiting on. He opened the window and in flew this big rose beetle, a big mother. And it flew right into his hand virtually. Uh, he took it in his hand. And while she was talking about scarabs and everything, he just, he just handed it to her. He walked over to her, handed it to her and said, here is your scarab. And she, she was flummoxed. She, it just broke through her rationality. Um, from then on, he made progress. But that's what he needed uh, to break the, the shell of a, <coughs> of a breakthrough, put a crack in the shell of the alien cortex. And then, then that was the first time she started therapy. Um, because to, to actually see that, you know, the things coming out of the blue, there are omens, there are things that come, um, <coughs> you can manifest things by by your your own thoughts and stuff. So um, it in I, I must, must warn you that this is dangerous territory in terms of um, you go to a psychiatrist or anything and you tell them that all of these things they will say that they they well known they one of the clues for say schizophrenia and they're called magical thinking. So they utterly. They don't believe in magical thinking. None of the clinical profession believes in magical thinking. They think it's a symptom of schizophrenia and very dangerous. So you, you be careful about what you say to people. I, other people can get you sections uh, by saying blabbering your mouth off too much. This is in our society. This is uh, forbidden stuff, um, and people, a lot of people will. Um, will sec involuntary section people close to them because they they are upsetting their own sense of security. So the Michael Shermers of this world will section their relatives. They have the power to do it in our society because rationalism is everything. And, irra and an irrational slave is a broken slave and they, they will quickly move to, to remedy that, fix that person. Um, fixing basically means controlling them, basically bringing them back in. And the history of that is ugly. It, it it's includes Rose Kennedy being, um, he, he couldn't get control of her because she was rebellious. And he had her lobotomized. So Rose Kennedy is one of the tragedies of the Kennedy family. And she was, you know, he, he got a doctor, said she was un uncontrollable. He agreed and lobotomized her. My girl just was lobotomized because she didn't listen to her father. Now that's that's the context of all psychiatry. So if you go back to the DSM, the, the very first DSM was was done as an army army manual on you know how for officers to diagnose troops basically um, with pathologies, mental pathologies. And so they, he wrote it was a colonel who wrote this. I can't remember what his name is, Matheson. I can't remember. But anyway, he um, he wrote this little guide for. For officers sort of to you know make a basic analysis of whether a guy is is nutty the two biggest pathologies in that in that manual um was uh, malingering and um uh passive aggressiveness to authority so that that was the the two commonest and egregious mental illnesses in the u.s army now the, they went from about, I don't know, 30 diagnoses to now 512-page you know, compendium of um, Medicare billing codes. Um, uh, and, and they're all essentially exactly the same thing. They're all just, they're all variations of 
Trypetomania. <laughs> Trypetomania is a, is a diagnosis, a psychiatric diagnosis that they gave in the South for many years, um, which was basically runaway slaves. They said runaway slaves have a mental illness that makes them run or, want to run away from their plantation. And so they called it trypetomania and medicated. I guess one of the, I wouldn't be surprised if one of the, you know, best cures they came up with was castration because that was common. But, you know, but it's, the DSM today is really just uh, various forms of trypetomania. <laughs> It's basically, they've just expanded all the types of trypetomania, and that's all it is. So in doing all this, this woo stuff, you have a bit of leeway. If you live in California, you have vast leeway, but it is a threat to the system. And, uh, and uh, you know, we're, we're in a prison yard, and it's a power game. And so if anybody, I just warn you that if anybody hears of this in in our society, you're, they'll do a witch hunt, and you will, uh, or you can, fall foul of um, of this prison yard that we're in. There is, so, there is anyway, some yeah. exceptions. There are some exceptions in Europe. Uh, uh, some Scandinavian countries, Iceland, Ireland, some parts of Scotland, and I don't know much about other countries, but I've heard there's there's still a place left for people who practice magic and who actually do woo stuff. Like there's a very um, accepted associations of druids here, and there's of course um, fairies are respected, like they are like the trolls in Iceland. So there are little cracks where you can kind of navigate if you if you if you're knowledgeable enough where you can um you can stand uh in less of a dangerous place plus in a lot of countries of europe i don't know how it is in the us uh, but you can't be sections unless you're a danger to yourself or a danger to others by your behavior so if you can't to say that you have um i don't know communication with uh, saints or trees or things like that normally unless you your behavior becomes dangerous to yourself or to others you can't be sections but there's ways of there's ways of going around that and i've seen that happening even i've had pressure by families trying to get somebody to be sections because they had visions and i told them you know it's not dangerous but they were you know and they find they'll always find a doctor they'll go around and they'll find somebody to so there is there is definitely a big risk of being too open about this um but there are some little niche. You have to, to know them. Yeah, the, the problem is the, the medication is uh, kind of like chemical castration by a thousand cuts. So it's a kind of little, you know, they, they've taken the violence out of the system and institutionalized it. So that's one of the things Steven Pinker doesn't understand. He thinks that, oh, now there, there are fewer wars. There's... You know, well, this he admits that there's more internal oppression in the state, but the but what what they've done is they've they've taken all the horrors of the early years and pretended they don't exist now. What they've really done is they've they've sneakily got you know they've taken chemical castration and and made it I mean made literal castration and all the brutal stuff they used to do up until the 70s in America. They've taken all of those. And, and hidden them under pharmacological uh, umbrellas and stuff like that. So you're still castrated, but they, they pretend now it's you know, medication. <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's basically what they're doing is they're getting, it's the, the alien cortex getting control of the reptilian brain. And then sometimes in females, they have a lot of trouble with uh, you know, anxiety about childbirth and things like that. So it's, you know, problems with, the mammalian brain hysteria so so yeah they all of these things um they just perfected their oppression that's that's what they've done they haven't actually <clears throat> they haven't actually changed in the slightest now all of this is kind of dangerous because to make progress uh the the psychological transformation is um psychosis you have to go through psychosis now, you've got a great excuse if you have psychedelics or psilocybin or something like that. You can always blame it on the drugs, and that's what people do. 
the problem is if you if you really do take the drugs they will hold you back you want to do this without taking drugs externally <clears throat> for the reasons i've discussed is that they will stop your natural ability they'll inhibit your natural ability uh, you know taking psychedelics and, and psilocybin and MDA and stuff like that mdma and they, they will um lsd all of this they, they will dampen uh, your own production of all these neurochemicals and serotonin inhibitors and stuff like that. So you don't want to take the real thing. You don't want to take that little shortcut because it's coming against you in the long run. So, uh, but here's the problem. It also takes away one of the great excuses for if they catch you, somebody, you know, catches you behaving abnormally or you can't do your job or something like that. Uh, they, if you don't have a good excuse, uh, then, well, then it's schizophrenia, baby. And uh, it's, schizophrenia is the catch-all. The, the, schizophrenia is they, they go and look at things in the DSM. It's utterly pseudoscience. It's, it's, it's a cell of witch trial. They, they go and look for things in the DSM. It's provable that it's complete, you know, quack medicine. It's complete quackery because if you get a number of psychiatrists no two of them can come up with the same diagnosis out of the DSM for a patient. You can prove it statistically. They're, they're basically just chucking a, a dart at a board. <laughs> they don't, they don't, there's no nothing behind it. Yeah, uh, and so, but here's the thing: if if they get a patient, they'll check off things. Oh, this one's got multi-personality disorder. This this dysphoria. This bloody blah. And they're, and, and, like they're only going to check off a number of things. I think if they get to about eight, they go, okay, this one has the whole basket. Then it's schizophrenia. They just say this one's nuts. <laughs> it's a, it's a uh, clinical way of saying this one's irredeemably nuts. And so uh, the, the problem is that, and, and in their mind, they assume that it's a degenerative thing that will, no good can come of it. You'll only go downhill. Now, unfortunately, they kind of, Correct, because not because there's some you know degenerative disease that's taking over people's brains and making <laughs> making them ill. It's because the system does that. The system reinforces it. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. So so yeah, you it is a terminal condition because once you get into their system, they start medicating you. Things will go wrong. <laughs> Everything your financial situation will be struck down everything will go badly for you and you will wind up the trash heap and then they will use you as an example of what happens to people that get that diagnosis not taking into account that they caused that end, end outcome now in other traditions like shamanic traditions and and uh, certainly in greece and stuff like that they're far more forgiving of that kind of thing i've seen some amazing stuff which in america the police would have come down and the paddy wagon would have taken that person away. And, and, but you know, they, everybody just kind of doesn't get very hit up about it in Greece. I've, I've seen guys have fights and, <laughs> and stuff and, and everybody just smooths it. It all kind of works out and there's no harm. And I, I'm amazed because if you see a half of, of an incident, like I've seen in sometimes in Greece and America, say in California, the police will come. Those, anybody involved in that, their life is pretty much over at that point. They, they will likely go, go through the legal system, the medical establishment. Um, they will get mandatory jabs and stuff, or all sorts of shit. And they, that one incident, which is, might be 10 minutes, um, will dominate the rest of their lives. And their lives are pretty well ruined after that. Now, that doesn't happen in Greece. It'd be to just say, like, you know, even even really, really nutty people are just accepted in Greece. And the amazing thing is that they don't, they're not so nutty. <laughs> the, the reason a lot, of, I think, I can't help feeling that a lot of the reason why the diagnosis of, you know, danger to yourself or others is the criteria or notionally the criteria in places like the UK and, and uh, in America. I can't help feeling that people are a danger to themselves they are doing self-harm they're cutting themselves and and doing this kind of thing because of the system so it, it is animals do it animal caged animals do it and stuff so so the 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 medical system without realizing it is causing the harm that they think they're there to prevent so um 
Uh, now, this is, you know, you could have just avoid all of this um, and just be good. Um, just play along, be a normie, stay on your career path, you know, work, play well with others at work, and, and just live a, a normie life and die. Um, the problem is that that's an unexamined life, and you will never reach the shamanic rebirth that was everybody's birthright before civilization and uh, incarceration and slavery. So from my point of view, I think we're heading towards, you know, a track time. You know, we're heading towards the collapse of society and the flipping in either order, um, but they're coming. And, and so things are going to get a little bit nuts. And you say, when you're talking about the what's the point of it all why don't you just talk you know unalive yourself today and not go through it all and stuff you saying that you know the point of life is really this transformational experience it is enlightenment if if you don't really achieve enlightenment in your in your life it's kind of like a damn squid it's you haven't you haven't achieved the potential of our monkey brain so it's, it's kind of like falling short. So now in this kind of apocalyptic end time, this is a perfect time to actually achieve enlightenment. Now, I've often said people will do it on their deathbed. They'll do it as the water goes over their head on this metaphorical Titanic. So, you know, you want to try speed it up. Then, you know, that's, uh, so that's what I'm, I'm saying. So. So anyway, that's a very long explanation for why we need to get a little bit woo. <laughs> Open the door to woo and blow yourself away. So woo away, okay? Open yourself to no, no, no. woo. So note, note to self, if I have a, another episode, a psychotic episode, I inform all the people around me that I'm on psychedelics, even though I'm not. So I won't be knocked in. They'll just say, she's a... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I was thinking of that. They just say, yeah, I use mushrooms. Don't worry. You know, and you can no, just... No, that's a great strategy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, great well, strategy. I th yeah. I think what would help is, you know, the people in your life that you don't want to scare away, you just figure out a narrative for them and then you give them that. <laughs> Well, the best narrative is if you have some excuse. You you tell them that you're going through this program that makes you nutty. They, they used to do it in like the 70s and stuff. There was, um, what was that thing called? Gary mentioned it the other day. Um, you know, uh, I can't remember what it is, but you all go into a room and, and go psychotic. Um, do you remember what that was? What was that called again? So if you do ESD? Remember? Is it ESD? Oh, yes, that's it. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, too, yeah. So yeah, they, they used to do it. And I don't think anybody does it now. I think I've heard of people doing these rebirthing ceremonies. I think that they get in a sack, <laughs> something like that, and they <laughs> they're making a rebirthing. They, that is an interesting thing right there because that is part of a lot of cults. So part of Freemasonry actually go through something similar. Um, with a coffin, you get in the coffin, <laughs> and so anyway, that's that's a, a hell, hell of an interesting thing. Um, it goes back to Quebec de Tepe, I think. I was just writing about that, um, in, in the next installment, um, that I never seem to get to now, um, of the layered brain book that I'm trying to write. It's, um, but uh, what it is is the Kista Mystica, and you can see three Kista Mysticas clearly in Quebec de Tepe, so. Yeah, it has, I'm sure it has something to do with Orion's belt and the three stars. But they, that Kista Mystica is part of the Mithraic cult. Um, it's uh, the Eleusian cults. And they always get in there with a snake, <laughs> and, which is a symbol of rebirth. So it's clear what, what the mystery is. Um, but it, it, it's amazing. It carries through in some bastardized New Age form um, to this day. Yeah. But it was part of um, the Schleppian um, Athenaeum and the, uh, the you know, uh, Schleppius' first hospital. Um, that, that was one of the things they did, right? They rebirthed people. 
So what we've lost is the rebirthing ceremony, um, the psychological rebirthing ceremony. And so you, you have to find a way of doing it now um, in the middle of this uh, prison camp where it's semi-forbidden <clears throat> to do that crap. Yeah. So yeah, but it, it would be nice. Uh, yeah, so if you find some space to do it in like a Buddhist ashram or something like that, then it's, um, yeah, it's a safe place to actually go, go through that. Um, but as a householder, it's difficult as all hell. You, you have to go completely nuts in place um, and go through your normal working day and not let anybody know. <laughs> Very hard. Yeah. So, okay, well, that was interesting little discussion. Any, any more? That was really a, a riff on the sigil. Um, and the whole ceremony for investing. And any more on that topic or should we move on? Yeah, I think I'm good. The okay. only thing I really need to do is get a camera. <laughs> oh, can't you just borrow somebody's phone, can't you? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll have to do that. My phone, I'm, I'm a cheap ass, but my phone sucks, so I'll have to borrow someone's good phone. <laughs> Doesn't have to be like professional. <laughs> hmm. I, oh, yeah. I read the um, the email from Lionel about um invoking strong feelings and um i have to admit maybe with some shame that i feel like um i can't um i can't summon enough strong feelings about something it's just you know that song or that song by i think it was pink floyd about being comfortably numb it's just it's just I'm kind of just deadened with, like you say, we're in the prison and the cycle of working and just day-to-day -day mundane stuff. Um, so I think I'm going to have to work on that. Like, what turns me on? Oh, yeah. F find some anger in there. You see, under, you see that Pink Floyd's The Wall? I mean, I would recommend you go and watch Pink Floyd's The Wall. And, you know, get close to that primal scream. You see that the, there's so much in the, in the wall, uh, Pink Floyd's The Wall, especially the bits with the, the kids, you know, the regimented, and it's like, we don't need no education. <laughs> and they all the kids are going to use it and the, have the clock on the wall there, getting them all to work and stuff. So the clock, all the stuff we've talked about, um, and uh, but but that there's there's a you know a real powerful scream underlying that whole movie. It's almost like the scream, um, you know, the painting by God. I can't remember anything today. Who who, who did the scream? Okay. I know that painting, but I can't remember the artist. Munch. Munch. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so underneath the the wall is like Munch's scream all the way. So, so you should meditate on that. Watch the movie until you get that a feeling, and then just maybe stop and and meditate on that and brew it. Um, get, go and you know draw draw the sigil in in the sand, you know, fire things out of it and stuff until you can dredge up uh, some some hatred. But there really is some hatred underneath that that numbness. Yeah. Just yeah. That well, that's I'll, part of the exercise on this. Yeah, is is to try and try and find that. Yeah. Yeah, it's a it's a challenge. Yeah. Yeah, but it's 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 worthwhile. Um, it, it's worthwhile in even in terms of that young and the scarab. So it it has elements of that 
<clears throat> the scarab thing is if you take it far enough, um, it will it will speak to you. There are <laughs> there are a lot of things. So, so something like this and an exercise like this can open a portal. You know, they, they talk about opening a portal. It's very weird. But yeah, you you can. There's there's weird shit out there. There's seriously weird shit out there. Um, it's 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 golden to actually see it and not get spooked. Um, but yeah, you you'll always get to a point where you can never quite be sure whether it's subjective and just you experiencing some crazy thing um, that's yeah basically that's irrational and nutty and you're just hallucinating. But, uh, you know, for example, like uh, Alistair Crowley had had this thing where he went out into the desert. He used to do that. He got out into the desert. It was a good way of drumming up these things, and that's why he did it, um, like the Sahara. So and in the Sahara, um, he had a fight with a jinn. It was, it was almost exactly like Abraham in the Old Testament. Um, had a fight with this demon, and uh, you know, it's just this guy who comes run, running over the sand dunes and attacks him, and he just like starts wrestling him, and he starts fighting for his bloody life, um, and then the guy, the guy, you know, takes off again and runs away over the sand dune. It was like in the middle of the freaking Sahara Desert. <laughs> like, where the hell did this guy come from? If if you go out into Joshua Tree or something like that, into parts of Utah and um, yeah you you can have experiences like that so you you will never you will never know but there's like like you've got scratches on you you know if, if you go to if you if you went to a psychiatrist and said look I, I just had this weird thing in the desert um, they'd say well what have you been taking and you say well nothing I haven't been having so, so something and they go oh and then they say well you know, they say, have you got like scratches or anything? And it's like, oh, yeah, well, there are lots of scratches and stuff. And you're better right. like, oh, okay, self-harm. They never once for a moment think you actually did have a fight with a gym and these are real scratches that are not self-inflicted. That is just not part of the, the training or worldview. So, so um, but, you know, I mean, there, there are places that are really psychically charged. There's one in in Glendale, <laughs> famous one in Glendale. I guess it's not too far away from you, Mike. Whereas the the Jack Parsons and these, it's well known. You go go there one day and experiment with it. But it's called I think it's Devil's Canyon. It's what it's called there. And like, um, yeah, the, the it's uh, there's this bridge, the old bridge in the 30s. That as you come into Glendale, I'm sure you'll know it, Mike. And then. The very first time I, I encountered all of this, somebody was driving on that bridge and somebody said, no, this is a really haunted place. And I'm like, come on, it doesn't look very haunted. Um, but since the early, ah, I mean, I think far back, maybe in Native American times in, the, in California, then that bridge was well known for all sorts of paranormal things and ghosts and everybody knew it was haunted. And they, you ask anybody around there, they'll tell you a story about it. But Anyway, just close to there, I think it's, De I think it's Devil's Canyon. It, it has a big, it, it has a big relief that looks like the face of a devil. And so, um, but anyway, the, lots of people have been there and they found they've uh, had a scrape with a gin and, and got scratched up and stuff like that. So then it, it leaves them completely fucked up because they're like, you know, the world demands that you scratched yourself and did self-inflicted wounds. You say, no, nah, nah, man, I, I had a fight with this real, real thing. And, you, you know, you know, it's a really absolutely real experience. And you just have to swallow it or otherwise go and talk to Jack Parsons or um, Anton Wilson and Robert Anton Wilson and those boys who are like, yeah, so like, yeah, of course that stuff's real. Yeah, you'll see common, stuff like that. It's common knowledge in, in, in where I live uh, in Ireland in general, but mostly on the West Coast, that there are fairy forts. And fairy forts are around structures, sometimes surrounded by walls, or sometimes it's just mounds of earth from ancient walls that have gone, but they're circular. And they're everywhere, every, in every parish and 
along, you know, they're, they're everywhere. And I, I mean, I've been told about them because when I arrived here, the kids were not supposed to go and play there. And I was asking why, <laughs> you know, and, you know, especially if you fall asleep there, it can be, you know, you can be taken away or parts of you can be, or your spirit. And um, I heard <laughs> the best thing I heard, and that's just a joke, but um, some farmer advising some German tourists not to put their tent <laughs> on one of them. And you should have seen the face of the German tourist when they asked them why. So, you know, because they said, you can put your tent in the other part of the field, but not there. You know, and they were like talking about, they, with their hands about the dangers of fairies. And the Germans were completely like they thought the guy was drunk or that he was just you know it was just so funny because they couldn't understand the seriousness of the advice of the farmer and he would never go there you know i'd i'd i sometimes used to see his his sheep going in there and the dog he would get the dog he would get the dog to get the sheep out of that place they never stay there the grass was always greener there <laughs> yeah mm. I, you know, I think we've lost well, lost a lot. There was the um, I, I was just thinking of Everett. Um, so Everett was with the, he relates the story where they had a collective hallucination, according to Western science, where the all the Paraha, everybody could see this um, spirit entity on on the other side of a river. It was absolutely plain to all of them, and they said like you know, they were amazed that Everett couldn't see it and the more he looked he said like i can't see anything there they, they were all describing it to him. they said you yeah, seriously you can't see this it's like yeah you know, like fucking slender man standing at the other side of the river and Everett couldn't see it um so he was in the opposite situation where they thought he was nuts that he can't see something so obvious that all of them can see um and you know it's a it's a real you know, pivot on our our society where where normally we would all be Everett's and you know we would be the Pura guy that can see the slender man on the other side of the river would be the odd one out. Now you might think that oh that's um better. You don't want to be seeing hallucinating and say it's no it's not quite that way. We, we you see we've substituted other things for, for those spirits. So I heard once that the Chinese people coming to America were amazed. They call, I heard the Chinese people call America land without ghosts. The early ones that came in the railways in the 20s and stuff. It's because they came and they found that Americans just didn't see ghosts. They didn't believe in them, didn't see them. They're like, they didn't believe places were haunted and stuff. And so they, they were amazed and awestruck and appalled. And, and and kind of marveled at the fact that you know seriously Americans you know Yankees you don't see ghosts you never see ghosts like, mm -mm, never see ghosts and they for them it's kind of like being a blind person but um, you see our rationalist and enlightenment you think like oh we've got rid of all of those superstitions and uh, we're better than those bone in the nose natives it's all prejudice. And what they don't realize is we haven't got away from that at all. We've substituted all this mad crap. We've substituted. So we've traded in all our ability to see all, all this woo stuff and the spirits and the paranormal. And we, we've traded it in for this insanity. You know, everything from like VR glasses to, you know, space travel and stuff. Um, it's... Uh, it's it's going to kill us. It's, it's terribly dangerous. What what we've done is getting rid of all of that stuff. So, so, um, but you know, I know from um, you know my upbringing in South Africa is we, we took it for granted. The story we to told ourselves is we, we were the enlightened white people. I can still hear my mom saying, you know, like, um, you know, Jesus Christ, these people haven't even invented the wheel before white people got here, <laughs> uh, and so. You know, it was um, we didn't no no colonialists respected the people. We just had this absolute conceit. The missionaries and everything is just in their own own correctness that lasts now still into liberal liberals have it today. They've just inherited it, and it's just this absolute conceit in the in their own self righteousness and uh, infallibility. But it's um, it's it's you know 
it's actually uh, it's actually weird because uh, you you know very very slowly uh, as white people stayed in Africa they started to see the, the wisdom um, of of the of the natives and they started to realize why the natives thought that the the white people were either little kids or a bit off their or off, off their rock they, the black, black people thought they were nuts and so, same with Native Americans they look in the Piraha they call they call every and any any white person they call crooked head they're like this, this person's nuts and and so it's uh yeah but we we are nuts I mean how you know 70 percent of people in in the US believe um Christian God it's like imaginary figure in the sky and they, all sorts of bad shit, crazy shit. But if you take all of that stuff away, people just substitute an idol. They just substitute, you know, I mean, look at Dickie Dawkins. He, he didn't have an avenue to, to go into the priesthood. He was heading for the priesthood. And so he didn't have that avenue. And so then he it was kind of robbed from him when he was explained Darwinism. All he did was turn Darwin into a saint. So, so Dickie Dawkins is running around being, you know, a Darwinist priest or this Darwinist religion. Um, absolutely unshakable faith in, in his infallibility and the correctness of his religion. It doesn't occur to him for a second that Darwin might be wrong. Not one second. It's unthinkable. As much as you know, you know, Tokumada would have thought it was unthinkable that the Catholic God was not correct and the Pope was infallible. And so you don't get away from this stuff. There's no, you don't free yourself from that. You just make a God out of bacon and the scientific method. And it's, a, you don't get anywhere this way. It's just a cheap shortcut, something. Cheap shortcut to extinction, by the way, because it implies all sorts of stuff that you've got to do, like the industrial revolution to make meaning in your life. And so, yeah, we, we the price of rationality is extinction. No, no one says that in, uh, on the tour of the Vatican or the or the or the you know the Louvre. You know, if you go to the science and engineering exhibit, they don't say, um, "I hope you like all of this," because price of this shit is extinction. Everybody goes, "Oh, Cape Canaveral launch! Oh, Elon Musk! Oh, look at us! Go, go, go! Look at the rockets and stuff!" And you say, uh, "You do know this is our extinction going up there." They don't. <laughs> but I think that's what's underlying this uh, blind belief in science at the moment in the pandemic we're living in, because um, people are the narrative and everything that's that's conveyed by the media, whether they're lies or just scared, scaremongering, people believe them blindly, um, and they, and they're insane, really insane. Their beliefs are. Uh, <laughs> And that's the same. It's the same operation because the the, the is this um, is this rational uh, language that the news is using every day to, to rally everybody behind their church. It's the same thing. But so insane is good. It's just that this is a mouse psychosis, and you're going for the good psychosis. So to get to the good psychosis, then is the next subject, and that's you know basically just having the the manifesto and the manifesto as I'm writing it, I'll have it for you, everybody to review um, shortly. But the, yeah, the thing is you just pull the carpet out from under them with the reality that, you know, all of this stuff is um, a vain conceit because the world is about to flip. Um, and science dudes, science, <laughs> you can't escape it. So it's just like, you know, Clocks run out. Your madness is madness. The clock ran out on you. And so I think we need to present that to the world. Uh, my prediction is that we'll be ignored um, at first. But, you know, maybe we can get onto the stage where they actually laugh at us. <laughs> that would be good. <laughs> um, and, yeah, so... Okay, so there's that, and I will carry on doing that. Um, oh, yeah, so 
Uh, there was something we didn't get to, which was unfortunate, um, because Petra was in the meeting this morning, and one of the things that she asked was about surviving the flippening. And she she asked in an email that I, I said we should discuss, should have discussed in the previous one, but let's discuss it now. And that's, I think, what we need to put in the manifesto is all our theories. Um, and And beyond the manifesto, we should do a lot of research and make a project out of this is um is how do you actually try and survive it and try and do some research and try and figure out what it really is going to be like because i've got all my own assumptions and and they probably need to be, be challenged um or they definitely need to be challenged so so yeah i i think one of the first ones is so so you know i in my mind i worked it all out but it's very idiosyncratic is very suits, suits me um you know like going to sea and stuff makes the world of sense to me um but i don't um you know i you know talking about hey can you survive the flipping underground or say in a mine shaft or something like that it's like i to me it sounds like a fucking nightmare but i get claustrophobic so i I think I might be inf influenced by that. So we must go through discussions and, and start discussing all of these strategies um, with the understanding that we want as many as diverse ones as possible because we want we want people to survive. We don't all want to put our eggs in one basket. So, you know, my strategy and why my thinking, I can go over why I think you want to be at sea. <laughs> um, but... It's kind of predicated on the fact that if you want to emulate me and go to sea, uh, you you have to be okay with the sea and you have to love the sea. You have to be okay with dying in the sea, which I am. I long expected that I would die at sea. And so I'm completely okay with that. And it, it's, uh, it, it's kind of a jolt for me to realize that that's horror for a lot of people. They're scared of the sea and the drowning is a nightmare for them. Um, so we must... It's, it is very personal, but I think it's very good therapy uh, to and catharsis to just go through all of these things and nut them out. So you, you want to be thinking of how you survive the flippening and less of, you know, how do we get geoengineering to save this civilization or how do we get solar panels or how do we solve climate change? It's like you, you want to basically put slam dunk on people is like, there's no point. It's done, baked, and said like even deep adaptation is too optimistic. It's like you don't even get deep adaptation. It's like deep doomerism is the end. It's like nothing, man. Anything you do is fuck all. You can't even do deep adaptation. It's, it's not even open to you. But you still have an odd sliver of light there that you might survive. And we know that other people have survived because they've probably been, you know, these four flippings in the lifetime of our species. So it is possible to survive. There are some things implied. One of them is that our population density was very low going into the large flipping, which is probably the, the younger dryers. And the ecosystems were intact. All the megafauna went extinct after that. Um, so we're going into this flipping, the next one, with everything in tatters. Um, particularly the marine environment, which I, I think is very important for survival. So, okay, so so do, does everyone want to talk about these kind of things like, going, you know, mind strafts? <laughs> yeah. Mind strategy for but somebody this morning in the meeting with the initials PH, I put a, a question that I, I just remembered there because we were talking about other things when he put the question and it was he was asking i can't exactly remember that in detail but he was asking where how will be the axe of the earth when when the flipping happens he was more or less saying is it you know and he was i think he, trying to visualize what it would look like and what it's oh, yes. yeah that was yes so okay now this is very complicated so in my book i i said you know my understanding of this and uh, is and i think this is the anybody that knows about this i think it agrees um so it's kind of established for insiders is the best place to be is at the pole of the flip axis is one of the poles of the flip axis so so you know it's 
you're going to go for a little like you know one of those um really gigs of kids in playgrounds you know one of those turntable things i can't remember what they're called um but anyway it's go kind of, merry go merry round. go round yeah so okay. you're going to be on a kind of merry go round and if you've ever been on a merry go round you want to be on the hub if you've ever been a kid i guess they don't have merry go rounds anymore because they're too dangerous but anyway when i was a kid we had dangerous shit like that and and you would um you could go and sit on the hub and you you know all the other kids were being mayhem all hanging off the edges right so it's kind of that that's the idea now the the idea is finding i call it the pgs the point of greatest survivability um and so that's really what this game is is find the your pgs so the thinking is that uh the you know, you want to be at the pole of the intermediate axis so i put the the, the actual coordinates of the, the, the the one I know. Um, I only know it from hearsay. So, and actually went there and uh, stayed for many days. Um, I just basically lay a hole. That means that you just drift. And it, it's a very, very strange place. So, so one of the, I mean, very, it's very strange in a lot of ways. When I was there, I just wait, waited to see what was special about it. It's, it's a kind of a nodal point, um, just right in the middle of the ocean off Crete. Crete. And it, it's, I don't know what it is. It's all, everything's kind of neutralized there. The current is neutralized there. So there's a lot of bad weather. If you look, I, I looked, you know, on the forecasts and things, and it was all forecast for bad weather. As it happened, there was never bad weather. It's kind of almost like a an storm. And there, there were this huge amounts of clouds and stuff circulating around the boat on that point but it was very like the eye of the hurricane there were a lot of birds there and there was sunlight in the middle of you know what's uh, windy in these wind prediction um apps and that's it was blanket stuff so, um, and i went did a little bit of research into ancient times and stuff and and you know this, and but it is a very special place one of the things that happened there was um, I, there were no magnetic anomalies, um, uh, but as far as I could tell. But there, but one of the things is the the boat uh, went round like a clock uh, every every twenty four hours. So when the sun rose, the bow was pointing in the east, and it, it tracked the sun all the way around. Um, when the sun was at high noon, the boat was facing. And then in the west, it, the bow was always on the sun. So it's um, it went, and this happened for three or four days. Um, and so I have no doubt there's something special about that place. Um, but yeah, um, the so anyway, uh, here's the thing: if you want to go and calculate where that flip axis is, it's very difficult. You need a lot of computing power. Uh, you need a supercomputer. I, I guess you could use a laptop and stuff and and an experiment. It's probably worthwhile. And I see there's stuff. There are more and more advances. One of them is AI thing I posted where where they said you can model the Zanibakov effect. So all of these things are, are very useful. And I don't think it's outside a layman's um, ability to do it. Uh, you don't have to be a government with supercomputers and stuff. Um, uh, you, so my theory is that you probably want, it's probably the same axis, uh, the, the flip, at least from the, the so the, the previous one in the Younger Dryas was based on the melting of the Laurentide ice sheet. It, it left the Greenland ice sheet as a sort of relic. So what we're doing with the Industrial Revolution is we're just kind of carrying on the last flip. So after the melt of the Laurentide ice sheet, we, we reached you know, um, a stable inertial mass um, uh, axis. So we, we're spinning around the, the axis of, uh, of least inertial mass now stably, or we were until the Industrial Revolution. So then from the Industrial Revolution, then, uh, 
it's going to melt the Antarctic and quickly. I mean, not the Antarctic, but it's going to melt the Antarctic, but an Antarctic's mostly symmetrical. So it's influence, but not much. Only the third pole, the, the uh, Himalayan Hindu, Hindu Kush, uh, Korokan ice field. Um, so uh, in high Tibet and, uh, and all the ice fields there, they call the third pole often. And then, and then Greenland. Um, so the, the uh, Greenland should, at some point, it could happen any day. It, it, no, it's very difficult to determine how much ice loss you actually need to precipitate um, the actual shift. The, the, the geographic pole is, is wobbling. They know that they know, and they know it's from ice lot loss. So technically, uh, if you watch the papers due to that geographic pole wobble, um, there should be some indication. But you don't, you don't really know how much of a wobble uh, you need. So you have a uh, the Earth has a precession of sixty-two thousand years. So it has this wobble motion of of sixty-two thousand years. Um, it's also inclined at like 32 degrees. So the, the inclination is where it found its, its, st its stability. So you assume that it would go and do not, maybe not quite a complete flip. And it's not, it's not around the equator. See, if you have a look at videos and stuff they, of the Zanibekov effect, they often have a kind of a T shape because that's the, the shape that you know, has three axis symmetry. So, they they show you a nice symmetrical t-shape like this the thing is the earth isn't really a t-shape like that so the the north the geographic axis of rotation is this pole which you all know about uh, the the uh the actual kind of bar on the t basically the the third axis or the intermedial axis is is kind of like a y it's kind of like a branch on a tree which means means the flip is not around the equator nicely like it would be if it was quite a T. So, um, so Hapgood and, and stuff that missed all, all of this about the Zanibakov effect. Um, and so he died not knowing. He died just thinking about Earth crust displacement. It, he and Einstein couldn't think of a way that they just got fixated on crust displacement. They couldn't imagine that the whole earth flips um you know because you have a liquid core and stuff and you'd think well the liquid core is surely going to stay the same and the crust is going to move that's the way they were thinking but it's not the way it works if you, this uh, american astronaut um flipped a water bottle in in space and and that showed you that the liquid goes goes with it um, but you can see actually it's worth looking up those uh those videos of of the of the water bottle spin, but if you see a, a fluid bottle, and if you think of a fluid a bottle of water as a perfect three-axis body to, to demonstrate uh, how the fluid works, now the the fluid does rotate, the fluid does um, move, which implies that the, it must have some implication on the geomag uh, magnetic pole reversal. Magnetic pole reversal is well known. So if you, so in, in the Quran, uh, they say in the last hour, there has a, they have this um, eschatology of the last hour. Now, if you ask an imam uh, that's kind of up on their shit, uh, Western wise, uh, he will tell you a whole lot of gumph about why it's scientific and he will refer to the magnetic pole shift. But it's not a magnetic pole shift. Clearly, it says in the Quran that the sun rises in the west. So it's clearly a geographic pole flip that they, they have some kind of folk memory of. And Muhammad got hold of it from some kind of Bedouins that he talked to or something. Um, it was known in, in ancient Egypt. Solon and stuff like that knew, knew about it. So, so uh, yeah. So um, the uh, that but... Uh, it's so it's what I'm saying is it's very easy to confuse it with a magnetic pole flip. If you talk about pole flips, um, immediately people think you mean the magnetic pole flip, which is uh, well established science because they can see it in lava flows and things like that. It never really occurs to them 
Why is there lava flow just at the time when the, <laughs> the magnetic pole flips? And it's like, well, yeah, obviously there's a bloody cataclysm going on. I, I realized when I was a kid, I, I, I was like, hey! Because <laughs> I was very interested in earth crust displacement and all the, uh, you know, all of that stuff when I was a kid. So, um, uh, the, but see, one of the things with uh, magnetic pole reverse, I read that they, they found out when I was a kid that they found an actual thing where they could see as the lava cooled, they could see the magnetic uh, deviation in the rock. So it was, you know, had a lot of iron in it, and they could see it move over a course of lava cooling. So in other words, over a course of 24 hours, they saw it move 180 degrees. And they're saying, well, that shows you that these flips happen, magnetic pole flips happen very quickly. But I was going, but look at the lava. It's like, what are the fucking chance that the lava is not associated with that flip? There must have been a fucking volcano. It must have been a cataclysm. So I was tearing my hair out as a kid. Like, look, look at the obvious. Um, so, into, yeah, but then later I found about Habgood and all of the earth crust displacement and stuff like that. So, the, but anyway, um, yeah, that, so so I'm just saying that the the flip axis is not the equatorial axis, which is what you would expect if it was a nicely symmetrical T-shaped thing. Um, so it's a, it's a kind of a knobbly potato, which makes it very, very difficult um, to to model. Um, and so you know, it's the whole of the Greenland Greenland ice sheet, by the way, doesn't have to melt. It's it just has to be this the, just a you know enough to tip it over and where that tipping point is is devilishly difficult to design and and how the characteristics of the flip and it has a lot of things involved everything including exactly where the tidal forces on one was was where the moon is precisely and in the sky and so down to the minute of of um of the day um to get all everything w worked out uh, and terribly terribly difficult to model uh, but yeah as, as each day goes by the the greenland ice sheet is melting exponentially hansen wrote a paper on that um way back in like 2012 and so the the uh so you know it's not a question of you know, oh, when will all the ice melt in Greenland and then we have to start worrying? Is like you have to start worrying today and every day you have to worry exponentially more. What I think will happen is that, you know, forget what Michael E. Mann says and all his misdirection and stuff, is that the methane dragon will go. Um, it's it's going gonna, it's gonna to go, after, I think, after the BOE is my hunch. So I think you're going to get the BOE then... Um, that's going to be too much for the the ESAS and the methane dragon. And so you're going to get a methane burp. You're already seeing the methane burp all over the world. We saw it in the Caspian Sea last year, and it went without comment. But they, they call basically methane burps in the Caspian Sea, they call mud volcanoes, which threw all the science journalists off because they didn't know. They were looking at a clathrate eruption. I went and looked at the... The sea, the sea temperature anomaly, and it was about six degrees. So, if six degrees is blowing clathrates explosively in the Caspian Sea already, it's like, well, the Arctic is the, the rate of, of uh, warming, I uh, call the polar differential or polar amplification, is like four or five times, as Beckwith often says, uh, what, what the average is of the world. So, um, it's based on the currents and things, but I think it, it would, um, you know, after the BOE, the Arctic's going to ramp up very fast. Again, difficult to mo model exactly how fast, but I can't imagine that you're going to have too many summers. You're throwing the dice every single summer from the BOE, and, the, and it's getting hotter exponentially. Now, at some stage, that small cap on ESAS is going to go. It's, it's already there's already seeps in, in the ESAS. So what you, you're looking at is a burp. It's basically a big chunk of this essentially styrofoam, which is the clathrates undersea clathrates that will 
erupt to the surface. They're not going to dissolve in the column of water as idiots like Carolyn Ripple in that say, because you know, it's an eruption of, you know, with a, you know, it has a big bubble. There's not enough surface area in the bubble relative to the volume for it to dissolve in 60 meters of water, Carolyn, not 100. <laughs> average, average depth is 60 meters in the east house. It was vast, vast undersea territory. So it, it was flooded when the Laurentine ice sheet flooded. So it was flooded in the last earth flip. It was actually um, tundra. So this is um, permafrost that then the sea covered over. Um, it, it's got a thin cap on it. Um, but in, in essence, uh, it's this, the sea uh, compressed it. And basically, so there's weight on it, um, which, which changes the you know, hydrodynamics of it. Um, and, and, uh, yeah, but it's, it's just, uh, waiting for the sea to warm, um, so that it can start ejecting clathrates as far as I can tell. And the reason I say that is I've seen videos of the, the guys tickling it. So they're trying to see if they can mine it. So they try, you can see videos by the USGS even where they're trying to see how they can get chunks of this to the surface. Like man alive, you talk about capitalists being blind. Because here they are basically celebrating that how, you know, what, how easily they can get this to the surface. Not thinking, did, did they ever stop to think past a dollar, you know, that maybe this is a disaster you're looking at? No, it's like they just got dollars in their eyes. There's almost unlimited CH4. There's almost unlimited methane, natural gas in this stuff. It's like, who hum? It's like, are, are you stupid or what? It's like, they. so you can see them in undersea rovers and stuff. And they scratch it out a bit, and it starts going. <laughs> it starts, it starts erupting to the surface, and they go, "Oh damn!" You know, the big problem we have in the USGS is it's easy to get out, and as soon as we get it out, though, it just you know, it goes up in a big burp into the surface. And so we we need to control that. And so, like, how stupid can you be? Are you not getting this picture of you're looking at down the mouth of your the dragon? And they can't see it for a dollar. <laughs> so, yeah. So anyway, I think that that's the way it goes. Is after a methane burp, it's you've got food insecurity, you've got um, water insecurity. There would be, you know, McPherson's thing that can't have grains grown and transported in in mass. Um, so uh, if yeah, if there's a serious famine or droughts, um, those have health consequences, uh, war consequences, and the the um, industrial system will stop. We've just seen an example now, um, just with with the shutdowns. So when the shutdowns happen, you can add 0.6 to one degree on top of the methane burp, um, as all the sulfates settle out and we lose the global dimming effect. Uh, so you add that as soon as they fall out, and that's a couple of weeks. So you're looking at not a very happy time. Um, and then, you know, I I think it will go, the Greenland ice sheet will go from uh, exponential to hyperbolic and, and in terms of just structural decay. It'll just be falling out in chunks. And the reason is that it's it's made like a layer cake. There's this kind of impact ice at about 600 meters, so it'll slide off like a blancmange, a badly made blancmange. Um, and so, the, yeah, that's so. As each day passes, we get closer and closer um, exponentially. So, uh, yeah, and then, yeah, so okay, survive and, and go, so going down a mile, so so it's very difficult to survive because you've got to. First of all, it's worth going through all of this stuff. And I hope everybody goes and fact checks me and makes sure that this is all correct and any new information that we incorporate it. But the, 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 there should be a large, uh, a lot of um, volcan volcanic activity, um, earthquakes as well. So you've been seeing there, there are a lot of exceptionally deep earthquakes now, which are unusual, which is not a good sign. Um, and it means that the earth uh, and the mantle is in distress. So the, these are not not very in, you know happy happy signals. Um, the so but then 
so okay so now if you go and look at man pinatabu or something like that and see see what that was like the year without a, without a summer um uh, back uh, in the 18th century th stuff like that uh, what what and there was there's uh, another volcanic eruption krakatoa in um and in medieval times, I think too, they they went through a, a very very harsh uh, couple of winters, um, and it was due to volca volcanism. So, so you you can have a look. You can get real world accounts of people living through at least one uh, thing. So, so the, these are called uh, mega mega volcanic things. I think they're called mega blips or something like that. But volcanologists have a word for these super volcano events. So they know they've been, they can see them. Uh, right at the Younger Dryas, there's a black layer, um, which they know now is not a comet. Sorry, Graham, <laughs> um, Graham Hancock. Uh, it's, um, it's, 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 it's a volcano. It's, it's a lot of volcanoes. So um, exactly, uh, so, yeah. So I presume that the volcanoes will be around the ring of fire. There'll be preferentially existing ones around the Pacific, um, the ones in the Arctic, there's, in the Antarctic, there's 70 under the ice, which they found in 2017. And those are good candidates for going, I think. Um, the, um, so you want to um, be able to survive something like Pompeii or Krakatoa, which includes undersea mudslides, um, includes tsunamis um, and includes uh, pyroclastic flows and all this really super nasty stuff if you close. So you don't want to be close to one of these these volcanoes. Um, uh, and you also want to know where the tidal waves and stuff go. Um, and uh, so, yeah, there's there's a bit of research right there for where, you, where you pick a PGS. Um, but you see, from based on all of that, uh, Petra's question about going down a mine shaft doesn't sound good to me. Um, you know, I see, uh, it, it, it makes me a little, little bit squeamish. I don't know what other people think, but but I mean, I, I, I think that that is the strategy of like the US military. They, they, they intend to do that shit, but, but they always think in terms of, you know, the military mindset thinks in terms of digging in. So they go down. They think in terms of going down Shaney Mountain and stuff like that, and you, they're, they're probably some some old mines um, that are very well decked out in secret. And so, um, for but they think they thought that way for nuclear war too. Um, if you, I know there are some guys out there that are are planning to go underground. Um, if you do that. You, you have to, I think this is what you're up for. You have to go and be a major expense because you have to go, I think you have to have nuclear batteries and stuff like that underground. Oh, hi, Ryan. Maybe, maybe Ryan can help with this. But I think you would have to grow plants <coughs> under artificial light, kind of like dope. <laughs> and the way, best way to do that is if you had a nuclear battery and stuff that could last five years or so. Um, and then you would grow plants hydroponically, recycle water and stuff like that. You, and that's kind of how military mindset thinks. Um, so, but they've got a big budget. <laughs> and so, but if you're prepared to, to wait out the volcanic winter, I guess you're going to, you're looking at about five years or so underground. <laughs> um, then uh, what you emerge to is when the sulfates the the volcanic winter is caused by global dimming by sulfates what we're doing now with pollution black pollution soot so the particulates in the air fall out um after not too long like if you look at pinatabu i think that was three years of, of cold of cooling probably pinatabu i think cooled the earth about a degree that's one fucking volcano so you're looking at a big plunge in temperatures. Um, and so, uh, and, you know, each year would it'd probably be miserable in terms of the weather and stuff. Um, all of these things can be delayed, by the way. What makes them even more complicated is it's very difficult to model the sea 
and all the, the AMOC and all the circulating currents and the Gulf Stream, all of those are very important. If you want to know how Britain turns out, it's in ter terribly difficult to work it out because the, you have to figure out how much ice melt comes off uh, of Greenland, it, base, it, it turns into freshwater melt that goes into the Atlantic, which will stop the overturning circulation, where, because it, if it's less saline, it won't sink. So you won't get the, the return of the mid-Atlantic conveyor. If that, that's the end of the Gulf Stream there. And at the end of the Gulf Stream, the Gulf Stream is warming Britain by, I can't remember, something like six degrees or something. It's extraordinary. It's basically, Britain is livable and temperate, but it, it should be the same as St. Petersburg or Vladivostok. So the, the you you know it's it should be like Siberia in in the Northern Ireland and stuff like that. But they it it's only due to the ocean currents that it isn't. Now those ocean currents, who knows what the hell is going to happen to them? You know, um, so so it's it's very difficult to do long range planning. But again, this is why I always come down to you want to be on a boat because it's impossible. You, you know, you just you just want to know that if it gets really chilled, you want to go somewhere else. So, so I always come back to a boat because it's it's mindlessly difficult to figure out exactly what will happen in any particular location. It's all dependent on marine cloud cover and um, you know what what happens in the weather after all of this stuff. The weather will probably get pretty extreme, but then so does the albedo improve and stuff like that. So. Modeling this stuff is really, I don't know, man, I, I, I think maybe it is just governments that can do it. But, but um, yeah, you can do it a little bit, like I think maybe figure out where the likely flip axis is or something like that. But to go in detail to do weather modeling after this, I don't think anybody really knows. Um, you could, you know, it's, it's even difficult to go back in the paleological temperature record. Um, you can see the flips. There's one place to see. You can see the, the flip cycle. Um, and then the other thing is, um, you know, the, I think the, new, the volcanic winter, there's not enough precipitation to lay down enough ice um, so that, uh, you know, you, it, it won't precipitate another flip due to causing a mass asymmetry. Uh, there's, there's not enough time and not enough precipitation to build up ice to cause another flip so so you get a one flip but in in over um you know if it changes the the ocean currents and that so you get a, an extended uh, glacial period um the the earth has shown that it can get stuck in a glacial period so off in the younger dryas it was getting colder and colder it wasn't getting warmer and warmer. It got colder and colder till the, the ice buildup in the Laurentide ice sheet caused the next flip. So it was so it's the ice and the not ice that changes the mass and, and precipitates a flip. So so you it means that they probably come in pairs. So what what what's happening is the volcanic activity puts up a whole lot of CO two into the atmosphere. That CO two is plant food. Just, just like all the climate deniers on the right wing say, they're right. The air, if we weren't hacking away the vegetation so vigorously, the vegetation would be actually um, uh, increasing. Uh, we would be getting forestation. We're getting deforestation because we're cutting it down mercilessly. But yeah, in some regions, uh, global warming has caused um, forestation, and uh, it's plant food. <laughs> Climatonies are right. What normally happens if, if you take humans out of the equation is the plants draw down the CO2 over centuries. We're talking about very you know, geological type timescales. Um, the Zola event was a particularly notable one where Zola drew down so much of the CO2, um, it plunged Earth into um, a glacial that then abruptly ended with a flip. Um, because of the buildup of ice. So then after that flip, then you, you assume then, you know, if, with the mass buildup, then the ice breaks down at some time and probably pretty rapidly. So you might get another flip um, in within 100 years or so, or maybe even quick. So the, it's, 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 the flip is not regular as clockwork. It's, it's stable. Un, it's, it's, it's unstable. So it's chaotic. Um, 
it's chaotic behavior um but none, nonetheless pretty predictable <laughs> you you can predict with the, the next one um but you i don't think you know, the, that that little the episode in the pleistocene is very regular so you can see it got into a very regular cycle which is that is really um what i what i call i'm going to call in um in in our um in our manifesto i'm going to call it the freeze thaw cycle the freeze thaw as in t-h-o-r you know the god the god of storm and thunder who's supposed to do the nasty <laughs> thaw is the god that's traditionally in folklore is supposed to do the nasty at the big floods and the end of days kind of thing he's the one with the hammer that um does all the volcanoes and stuff so so anyway it's kind of a good joke i thought to uh, freeze thaw t-h-o-r um and so but what's what's happening is these cycles of volcanic uh, activity throwing up uh, CO2 um, the, and warming the CO2 through the greenhouse effect warms the plant dramatically. Um, and then plants thrive. It's actually a wet environment, so you get more um, precipitation and you, know, you start getting um, uh, at previously tropical, you know, Arctic latitudes, you start getting tropical plants and crocodiles and stuff. And, which are visible in the, in the record. Um, so as the, the plants say thank you very much and start gobbling up all the CO2, they overdo it to their own detriment because the plant is generally cooling as they're munching on the CO2 and, draw, and sequestering and drawing down. See, Ciozola was freshwater uh, fern that floats on the water. Zola floats. still exists today, by the way. And it, it's... it's uh, it dies, it works it goes so freaking fast, as all that, that the, the layers, um, new layers grow on old layers and cut off the sunlight to them. So the old layers die, they kill off the compadres and the old growth falls down to the bottom of, well, in freshwater lakes, it's a freshwater fern. And that's how it gets sequestered. That's, I think, where a lot of the carbons and coal and stuff came from, from the Zola. But so the the growth of plants and stuff with particular plants like azola can be very fast it's also done with phytoplankton and um, marine life in particular is drawing this thing down they will dying and going to the bottom of the sea where it's thoroughly sequestered and so this uh yeah drives cooling the cooling cooling um causes glaciation and a buildup of ice the ice then causes uh, the the next flip and then causes the volcanic activity and that's that's how the cycle goes so so we 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 had a previous flip of the younger driest the older driest might have been uh it's it's comparison flip it's pair they probably have pairs of well, flurries. Sorry, sorry in the i remember from school and all that but in the younger driest uh, was it not just a magnetic flip or was it just i don't we don't know i suppose how could we no, no, it's, I mean, you know, I, for I sure, it, 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 was, it was a geographic pole flip. Uh, I, I'm not sure if it was a magnetic pole flip. I'm not sure if if that corresponds to the younger drives or not. Okay, well, I think I, the, I'll check. I can't remember. Yeah, I, I, I haven't looked very closely at the correspondence between magnetic and geographic pole flips of the drives, so... Um, I, I got the impression that it was was older. I thought that the last magnetic pole flip was about forty thousand years ago. Is what, what I thought. So, I think it it didn't correspond. You see, there's there's a danger in in looking at all uh, at at the the geological record and a lot of things like the ice cores and stuff because so, because scientists apart from government scientists, but civilian scientists don't know about the pole flip. It's not mainstream so th they misinterpret stuff like ice cores they they assuming that they're measuring a local area so they have a local core in say Green greenland and they are correct they are measuring a local area they, they may but they see flips in the record and they don't realize that the pole is shifting so they they misread the record saying oh this is a time of cooling this is a time of warming there's a dramatic shift 
here and stuff. And they're making extrapolations to the whole globe. But they might be just local variations because the pole came to town. So in other words, you can, you know, you can see an area that's under the poles now becomes tropical and then you know freezes again and has a glaciation event. See, in their minds, it's oh the earth has a glaciation event. Oh, the earth warms and stuff, and say, no, you, you could just just Africa and you'd see that there's a you know, in, in South Africa there's a big ice cap, but in like go to South America or something and you'd still see it's still tropical. You, you see, you know it must be that way because all the animals survive. If if the temperature if you took the temperature record that they they assume, um, there's no ways all these animals would survive. You if you look at all the fauna in Africa, I mean sure, okay, you can make a good estimate that the megafauna dies off. Um, a because after the younger dries, um, actually before the younger dries, uh, humans had spread all over the world. So, so they they take out they take down humans take down in this overkill scenario and take down the megafauna. But the megafauna are in a bad shape after the the climate's change. But they must they must exist somewhere. They they they're still mega, you know elephants and stuff still exist. There's still elephants and whales and stuff like that. So. But you can't, you can't have the, the Earth go through those temperature changes and then say like, how did the crocodile survive? They're never going to ask, you know, a pathologist or something. It's like, say, how did these nematode worms survive and stuff? And you, you, they never do that. They're never going, you know, they don't talk to each other, scientists. So they, they, you know, the paleo -ge geologists never going to ask the evolutionary biologist and say, you know, like. Well, there must have been a nice little warm pool somewhere for this mother to survive since the, for the last few billion years. That they never, they never go and do that. So they never, they never twig that they, they're looking at a pole shift. They're not looking at a, just a local temperature variation where the assumption is that we have the same pole axis and the same poles. So they're continually mystified. It's always baffled. So, so when you see an ice core or something, you have to go and factor that in. You have to know where they got it from and know what they're looking at. But they, they make all sorts of foolhardy things. Like I saw, I saw Michael Mann leap on this bit of thing because because his thing is like, oh, you know, all the doomers say about the clathrate gun and that's been debunked. Well, bullshit. It's uh, Michael Mann's been debunked. Uh, my, Michael Mann carefully says. Well, they all said that, you know, the clathrates would happen and, well, he's talking about McPherson, basically. He's saying that, and all the clathrates would go off and in 10 years, everybody would be extinct. So, well, and he says, there's no scientific evidence for that. Well, correct, but it's a straw man. There, there was no good counter argument to what Shakova and Samelitov said, which is, we're in deep shit <laughs> now. <laughs> so then these other freaking idiots went down to the Antarctic. And they said, no, no, you don't have to worry because in, in the last, you know, uh, big epo epochal event or whatever, the um, glacial melt or something, he says, there's no evidence of a strong methanol. You say, of course there isn't, you fucking moron. You're in the Antarctic. And the, 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 the the methane pulse doesn't last for more than a few years. It falls out exponentially, though. So it's 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 the the methane you're looking at is turned to CO2. So if you look in the thing; it's staring in your face. There's a big CO2 pulse, but they ignore it and say, "Yeah, you're okay from these." It's like, "What's the CO2 pulse, moron? There's your fucking CH4. It's been ionized with OH." So it's basically you're looking at the fucking methane pulse, telling the world and Michael Mann running around saying, "Oh, it's okay, we debunked it. Look, we looked in the Antarctic." And it's like, "Oh my fuck, these people are stupid." You see, basically, if you if you want to not see it, sure you can cherry pick whatever you like, but you see, once once you figure out this is what is happening, then you can't but see it, and everything falls into place. But the, the world, you know, geologists and all these scientists, the, the world is a complete mystery to them because they can't understand why, you know, Milankovitch cycles don't match with, with what they see in the climate record, why the fossil record has, you know, fucking 
broadleaf tropical plants in the Arctic and, and, and crocodiles and freshwater plants where they should be. And it's like, guys, it's obvious. The earth is flipping. The poles are moving, man. But anyway, it's, yeah, it's, so it's, it's not mainstream. So you have to interpret all of the stuff they, they say. Um, but yeah, I, I think we should go through these scenarios and see what other people think. I mean, try and think of what you would like to do. Like, like Pedro's thinking, like go underground. And we should look at it. We should look at it in, in depth. That's it. I'm just saying off the top of my head, it's like, sounds like a nightmare. I mean, you, you've got to also survive earthquakes, right? And to me, have you been down a mine? <laughs> if you're South African, you're likely to go down a mine. Man. I'm totally claustrophobic. I wouldn't dream of going in a mine. I don't think there's any. <laughs> that there's any scenario that the only scenario is to prepare yourself personally because I don't see like I mean this sort of survival seems completely crazy I mean <laughs> I my, mean my, uh, my my first thought of the mine is like the scene in Watership Down where those rabbits get buried by the construction crews you get buried in their warren that's the first yeah. thing I think about like, what if you're in your mine and you're like, you know, the government or whatever, and then a lava flow like seals you in there? Yeah, I mean, not, <laughs> you know, you're not a rabbit, so you can't dig another tunnel like you're just a little human. Why would you go underground? Like, it's like, no, I don't know. I don't understand that way of thinking. Uh, yeah, no. I see. As being underground, um, you better be ready to be buried there because <laughs> that's it. There's usually no way out. <laughs> and it's like, why are you guys going in that grave early? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Show's not over yet. <laughs> you could go uh, lava surfing. <laughs> I don't know. It's totally yeah. impossible to imagine. It's totally impossible to even think in those terms. I, I, I just, it's too much for me to think about that. Yeah, it's, um, it's pretty crazy. I'm not entirely sure exactly what I could do. Um, I'm not that far from the coast, so if I got a boat, I could fish. I like fishing just fine, and fish is one of my favorite foods, so... I think also you have to have a possibility of moving around to not being ready to just leave your base. I think if something, anyway, if something happens, even not the flipping, but you know, you want to be prepared that you're not too attached to your base and that you can, can become mobile nomads if you need to, um, you know? Yeah. I think it's really essential that you are able to move around. Uh, I, for, for COVID, I was able to dodge all of the COVID issues because I saw it going exponential and I got out in time uh, and I got into China before they closed the borders. And it's there's been no problems. Um, everything's been open, no lockdowns. And you know, I just planned it because I knew the government here would handle it and the rest of the world wouldn't. So I, as they were diminishing, I was able to uh, not be, or as the issues in China were were bad and the rest of the world was fine i wasn't in china and then as it flipped i flipped with it and i um i you just have to be ahead of the trend lines and um you can get uh you can get ahead of a lot of stuff and if we know more about what's coming then we can we can uh, you just have to be a little bit faster and this is important for the managed extinction situation so uh you you have to be faster than the government. You have to know what the government is about to do and, and get out of the way. Um, and the, the nice thing about um, a boat is that it's expensive for people to chase you. 
So if you have, um, if you're on land, you know, there's going to be a whole bunch of climate refugees coming around all over the place. And it's going to be a really an, an unfortunate situation. Um, but if you're on a boat, someone else needs a boat to chase you. Um, and if you're faster in your, your boat, or you, if they need gasoline and you, you don't, then you're in a good situation. Right. So it's, I think it's uh, uh I think you should try to be poly you should have different options. You should not stick to one. I think you should even the idea when you said gasoline that gasoline, suddenly I thought, no, that's not really the way to think about it because that means that you're going to be stopped by something that would be probably restricted or that well, would I, I said, and you know as in uh, you'd be sailing and they would need if they had a gasoline only vessel, then they couldn't chase you. I mean if, yeah, if yeah. I know what you mean, but if you're not depending on that, and if your your aims are small, let's say that you've got animal traction on land, or sail on sea, or you need to have options where you can get to sea, you can get to land, you can know, you have to explore where you are and what how far you can go without depending on any um, any technology, basically. And you know, yeah. I, uh, I so, think. I think bicycles, horses, and boats are probably your best options. Yeah, but also a base because uh, you have to have that too. You you can't just you know you want to have to be able to move away to higher ground if needed, and come back. And you know there's all sorts of different. You you should not be stuck in one thing. I think you need to have a mind that's adaptable and and that you 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 you're good at different things, but you're not attached too much to a to a to a place and to an outcome and that you know that you could suddenly lose everything and you know and that you you're prepared to live with very little and that you might have to go to high ground come down to low ground but not in a mine uh. <laughs> yeah um i think um one one way is uh there are like in in the u.s there's uh some inhabited some mountains and stuff that the, the tribes used to inhabit you know there was good foraging out there good mushrooms good good um berries and things like that and some of those things that haven't been um you know uh fossil fuel agricultured uh, may still exist right so there are uh, if you do know your environment i think a good way is to go to what was the uh, are, are there any um, kind of indigenous knowledge um, uh, about your environment that you can tap into? Um, but don't forget that that could be completely changed. For example, what you were saying about um, the, the volcanic winter, um, or it could be much worse than that because a lot of vegetation could suddenly go. So your, your ecosystem that you think that your indigenous people know could be totally devastated looks a bit like a nuclear winter or something you know you could have suddenly so it's 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 uh, it's you're back to again to a kind of uh, a prepper survival type of reasoning and I, think I, don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with prepping in that way though because you can't discount the fact that there will i mean you have to kind of i mean if you're going down this route then you have to kind of prepare in some sort of way and i would say the best way of preparing is say for example today I just signed up for an online elementary bushcraft course, which I've been meaning to do for years. And it's with a guy who I know is really good. And he had a typically, you know, of course, he had a discount, like all these it's kind of not a Black Friday, so to speak. But he he's got this course and it's it's a distance learning one. I'm happy to like, post it. But, you know, it's got everything you need to know. You can do it in bite sized chunks, take it over time. And it's all the kind of things like trapping um cutting tools how to use knives and axes and saws in a safe way um how to source water you know like how to um uh, i i'm not sure if it actually goes into the butchery side of it but i'm sure he's got links to that as well but there's a whole series of sort of those kind of skills which okay yeah if we're going to end up with you know the, the absolute apocalypse in terms of the the sky has fallen in and there's just complete black you know ash and everything then yeah i mean you, what you're going to do you're pretty much done for like yeah that has happened and if you're really in the midst of that um or if you um yeah or if there's a huge 
uh, crop failure the following winter, but at least there will be some things you can scavenge using those kind of skills. I think that's still a valid way of prepping, at least in some sense. It doesn't mean that you will necessarily get out scot-free, does it? But at least you might be able to, I don't know, find some clams or, <laughs> or some some sort of dead animal or something that's only just been slightly, you know, only just died or something. I don't know. Like, yeah, I think you're there, there's, 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 there's something there, surely. I think <laughs> to acquire skills that you're not being given anyway because of our society. So lots of people don't know how to build a fire or use an axe. or And these things are very, very important. And, but I, what I was saying is that you have to be very flexible because it because as you were saying the scenarios are not written we don't know anything you know you know so you have to we were saying when you were gone here we were talking about um where we should be and and we're saying well to be in different places to be able to move uh, but at the same time you know knowing that you uh, knowing where you are and knowing what's what's there and having ha have being flexible not being attached too much to a place but at the same time uh, you know, using a basic, for example, I'm near the sea. I know I can jump on a boat if I needed to, but I could also be on land. I can go up the hills. You know, I'm just thinking in my small little universe, you know, I don't think I'm going to run the other side of the earth to New Zealand or Greece to to live on a boat at this stage of my life. But, you know, there's there's all sorts of different things that might happen. So you want to be prepared to all options. But first of all, you want to be prepared in your in your mind. And, and I think that's the most important. Yeah, well said. Yeah, well yeah, the, um, yeah. I, I think it's a good idea to get skills, but it's it's a good idea to just go back and read about, um, you know, the year without a summer and uh, after Pinatabu and stuff like that and Krakatoa. And see, um, yeah. The reason I dropped off was because it's like well, the weather's getting vicious. <laughs> So, um, yeah, suddenly I lost cell phone communication. I, I mean, it's, how, how long was I gone for? I was talking there forever. About and then five minutes, maybe five, five, ten minutes, maybe, maybe five minutes you were gone, that's all. Oh, wow. I, w I was yeah. talking away. I didn't realize I was disconnected. It was, it was, it took me. <laughs> Fine. Um, well, we took over. So, yeah, anyway. So, yeah. So, I must think up those kind of things and i think we must um yeah read up on them and then report back in in terms of what people's theories are well i had an interest in the i had an interest in the past in that year because i was i went through it through paintings i i put a, a link in the comments because the paintings of turner during that year were very inter interesting for the pigments and for the the colors that how he, he rendered but there was a famine there was a big famine all over europe so uh, every country um, and that was just in the middle of the Napoleonic Wars, 1816. So it was just after Waterloo. So it, not only was Europe devastated by war and, and everything, but that winter came afterwards. So it left a terrible legacy all across this part of the world that I, I know. So um, I think it's, uh, yeah, if, if there is this sort of thing, famine is the number one thing. Oh, yeah, the um, the other thing um, I remember, I went to Iceland a few years ago, and um, there's a lot of history there. Um, back in the early settlers, that was that would have been the yeah the early medieval period, like after the ten hundreds, I think, or nine hundreds, and they had yeah some big volcanoes go off there, and it was absolute disaster. Yeah, a lot of them just yeah were poisoned by all the you know the mix of different chemicals from the volcano. So, but they did persist which was interesting but yeah i think like has been mentioned before they went there as pastoralists and then yeah they found it was really hard work to get anything going there um kind of interesting that they kept going back there um i guess because of that volcanology there you do get fertile patches but but again i mean they went and chopped all the trees down and it was very hard work but but yeah I, I, and uh, yeah, the, the period in the Victorian times, I mean, that led on to the, um, lots of Mary Shelley's work, didn't it? Um, was that after Krakatoa, wasn't it? They had several years. Or it was, yeah. Pinatoba, I can't remember one of those, yeah, in Asia, that huge volcano that went no, off. But and Mary Shelley travelled across Europe uh, just during that, that catastrophe, just after the war had ended. 
when when England had defeated Napoleon, and she saw the horrors, and I think that put her in the mind of writing Frankenstein. <laughs> yes. Think. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, one thing that I would recommend folks do is um, is setting up uh, second res residencies and and passports. Um, so if if anyone has any questions on how to do that, um, please contact me because um, I, I can I've been doing research on that for a long time. Um, but I I think uh, residencies are a bit cheaper. You can if if you can show some some income. Uh, uh, sometimes you can get in to to Mexico or some of these places that and um, get a permanent residence there without too much effort, and um, and then you you're allowed to be somewhere. So if if a government hasn't collapsed, but the economy has, you know there there's still ways in. And for 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 example, if you are doing a boat strategy, like think about geographically which ones are going to be important for that. Um, and get permanent residence there, um, where 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 it's important to get that. So I, I'm I'm going to Panama uh, in in a few days uh, to pick up my permanent residence there, for example, because that's a geographically important region um, for for boating. Yeah, that's a cool one. That's a very cool one. Um, I'm just in the Suez Canal at the moment. <laughs> Yeah, the, the the other thing is to is the opposite is to find governments that collapse are liable to collapse early, because you you also want to find a place where the government has collapsed. Yeah, I'm, I'm not excited about Somalia during during the <laughs> during the heat wave. Well, yeah, but think of it after. See, a, a lot of these places are are going to be wiped out. But afterwards, um, you have to imagine them, they're going to be quite different. So, for example, yeah. take a really populated place like the Indian subcontinent. Now, I, I think it would be a nightmare to be anywhere in India after, after an event like that. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's you know, wait a few decades and you might have a whole place to yourself. Yeah. Maybe um, uh, what's what's the, the Chernobyl might be a good place to to go. Pretty depopulated. Um, no, but it would be. No, no, don't joke. It's like the the, the that wasn't a joke. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought you were you know, being facetious. No, but that yeah, there there there's uh, there's a little old woman living there quite happily into her nineties and stuff. You see that it's radiation is very funny. Because it's it's like being you know li almost literally shot with a bullet. There's all all these ionic radiation. Is when you you shot with a an alpha particle or something like that. It's like being shot with a bullet in in terms of what it does to your DNA. Um, but you know it can theoretically repair just like you can recover from a bullet wound. So uh, it, it's it's kind of like radiation is that if you if you take a big dose, it's kind of like getting hit ten times with you know wounded 10 times with a gun um, and you probably wouldn't survive that but if you got like shot once a year for 10 years you might you might survive so um, you see that the animals and stuff are thriving in Chernobyl and they don't have two heads and they're not all completely screwed up um, but you know, yeah. If you if you look yeah. at the South, South Sea Islanders in bikini and stuff, they're not in good shape. From from an animal's perspective, uh, it's way better to take the radiation than to be around humans. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and you you see the the thing is 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 your reproductive fertility. So so from an animal's point of view, is um, if you get like old age uh, thyroid cancer or something, it's not a big deal for a wolf as long as they they can uh, procreate, right? And it's kind of the same for humans, is a lot of the radiation risk and stuff hits you with melanomas and stuff in your old age. So it's like, yeah, well, old people are kind of expendable. So it's, um, it's, uh, 
it's a, if you if you're young and fit and you make make it through childhood leukemia and stuff like that, then then you're good to go until maybe your fifties. Yeah, so, that was funny about uh, Chernobyl, wasn't it? Because um, I mean, they spent a hell of a lot of money there in the last decade, like building this whole new uh, roof to cover the whole structure. So there's this like you know hundreds of millions of European Union money that went in to build this absolutely enormous structure, and they put it on rail tracks and then just skirted it over the top to cover the whole original building because it was obviously uh, that sort of concrete structure was dilapidating and uh, it was set to sort of fall in. So they thought, well, build a roof over the top. So um, yeah, that's probably working out a lot better than, as you say, the the islanders in the Pacific who got bombed by nuclear tests, didn't they? <laughs> yeah, I, I think birds and stuff are getting in the old structure. So the, there were animals and stuff that were taking radiation out and spreading it around. But it's 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 good, well, money well spent for for Europe because all that radiation gets in the milk and stuff like that. Because it accumulates in cows and stuff. So that is what that is something to think about is if you intend to be a pastoralist and live off cows and stuff, uh, you probably buy accumulating cesium and radiation in milk. But you, you want to make sure that you're well away from a radiation zone. And if there's uh, any kind of war, so if there's like a, 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 nu a nuclear war and then you get a nuclear winter, you want to make sure you're well clear of fallout and stuff. You don't want to be eating, living off stuff like milk or stuff when in, in that scenario you'd be better off uh, living off fish or something like that think, thinking in terms of farming animals I, I don't think is a great great strategy no definitely not no i completely agree with that i mean I mean other than bush meat you know, hunt, hunting bush meat is a good option because if if you wind up being in a colder place um yeah, hunting and trapping is the way to go. Even in and knowing place. knowing how to how to how to climb to climb rocks and and cliffs and trees for eggs, because especially some seabirds or some other birds, you know, you can steal an egg now and again, and you can share it. You know, it's not good, but if you want to eat, you can. If you know how to, you know, there's some nest where you can. I know some some places on the cliffs where you can snatch. You know. Or you can, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah that's really common in um, up in the north of Scotland on the off the islands there, um, and off of Ireland as well. Yeah, that was really yeah, really. Common. Ireland, big, on the island. Yeah, yeah, like the Giga men um, off of. They go to this out to this island off of the northwest of Scotland, off of the um, uh, the Outer Hebrides, and they go specifically to this tiny little island. It's really hard to get to as well because the weather is often absolutely shocking. And then they climb up these cliffs. It's really dangerous to get these seabirds. Um, I think it's pretty grim, but <laughs> it's a delicacy. And then they, you know, they they boil it up and. Uh, you know, but you can, you know, when there's plenty of birds, you can always, in places, certain places near the ocean, you, you, and in the woods, you know, it's uh, sometimes they fall, sometimes they, you know, or you find an egg if you know little places where they nest, uh, you know, sometimes you can be lucky. Are there any species that we think might be, um, uh, be, have, a, have an advantage? Um, like yeah. sea urchins or something. I don't know. No, no, uh, fish, birds, and insects. They, they, they will all do pretty well and migrate. It's, it's, um, it's megafauna and mammals about our size that are going to struggle. I thought insects were already like pretty well wiped out. Yeah, that's the problem. Th that's why we need the flipping to come soon. Because yeah, the, the you know, yeah. The, the, in, the insect Not loss the is due to civilization. The locusts are doing fine. They hide in, you know, they hide in the desert in the heat, and they wait for a bit of rain, and then they become a swarm, and they, they, they can survive an awful lot of stuff, and they're extremely edible. Yeah, how I learned to love the pestilence and plague.
I think um, in the early stages of something like this, the obvious thing, well, I know here in the UK is deer. There's a lot of deer, <laughs> but of course they would die off quite quickly once the if the foliage and things is all starting to get yeah you know die because of some you know lack of sunlight but yeah and yeah the, uh, there's a hell of a lot of deer <laughs> there's too many to kill they're, they're having well, i hate to i hate to say this but one thing that's going to survive pretty well a pet there's there so many cats and dogs that are, are liable to survive their owners especially cats so yeah i mean feral cats and dogs are gonna be, <laughs> you're in a great place in greece Greece has the most little cats everywhere. Yeah, yeah, there's an infinite supply of nutritious cat. Are you going to keep a few cats on the boat? <laughs> oh, I, God. I, I, do, I, I do make myself unpopular by saying that kind of thing. Because people try to force pets on me and stuff, and I, I, I can usually get them to stop by saying, making comments like, you know, Actually, that's probably a good idea. If I get caught at sea in an extended voyage or something like that, they might be very nutritious. They generally withdraw the offer of their cat at that stage. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, is, it, is it crazy? Um, uh, it sounds crazy to me. Um, but uh, uh, to keep livestock on a boat like uh rabbits or chickens or um mealworms or something like that no not at all they were that was how in days of old when they had to when they were on voyages they took loads of livestock didn't they the vikings and the the European explorers that went to the New World, they had lots of livestock, didn't they? And all sorts of birds and and Noah with his ark. So you... You just muted here. Cut up for me the, the... You're breaking up, Hugh. We can't hear you. I don't think Noah brought those animals so that he could eat them, right? He was trying to save them. No, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> no, but he the brought the unicorns like... to, for, for well, food. You, never know, you know, the story could be totally wrong. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> he too. was a delusion. He thought, how are we going to survive? So we take all these animals. <laughs> you know, we can rewrite the, rewrite the Bible. Well, again. My, the storm here, and it's like, Cutting everything out. Yeah, it looks like the storm that Hugh is having is not going to be. Anyway, the meeting has lasted two hours. And, <laughs> and this morning, the meeting lasted three hours, guys. I, I just tell you so. I'm in, cow. I'm in overdose now. I just don't know how I'm still awake. So <laughs> I don't watch movies anymore. I just listen to all these. I just view all these. Um, yeah, same here. Meetings. Same here. Totally. I haven't watched a movie in ages. There's enough going on to keep you going. Like, and you couldn't take more. With your eyes would get sore. Oh yeah, like. Um, I don't, I mean, occasionally with a friend I'll watch a movie, but I don't, I definitely don't touch TV because I feel like that literally destroys your ability to have your own dreams. So that might also help people who are going to do the thing with the symbol. Oh, I don't have a TV. I threw mine away uh, 15 years ago. I shoved it in a shed and never had a TV again. I know it does something to your dreams, doesn't it? So do phones. I, I'm i sure that um, Elon Musk can insert some dreams. Um, they'll have, you know, a premium where you don't have uh, ads in them, but, but otherwise I think he can give you your dreams with electrodes in the skull. Oh, God. He's working on it. That's, that's awful. He, he's, he's, he's working on it in my cartoon. And he, 
So, uh, guys, I think I'm going to have to drop off because there's a vicious storm and the, um, I, don't, I can't seem to keep connectivity. And there's like other alarming sounds and stuff going on around the boat. <laughs> like there's a, oh, is that the there. same storm that we had coming down south now? It might be. Yeah, across Europe. We had a really big storm coming down from the Arctic that hit the northeast of UK. It's pretty fun. It's coming down through the phone, uh, through the the phone. And oh, I'm not sure. I'd need to look at the um, yeah, weather map. France, it's roaring out of the the. Uh, yeah, it's it's basically roaring around Sicily and then coming to Greece, but. Um, yeah, it's 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 going to be for a, for a few days, and it's freaking alarming. I tell you, it's like the a dinghy. and stuff taken off. Uh, yeah. Oh, the, which reminds me of another thing that you need to take account of if you want to work out the flip axis, and that's uh, Coriolis force. Coriolis force is also one of, an issue. <laughs> anyway, do, do you guys want to carry on with, without me, or do you, do you want to end it now? I think it would be nice to end now. Okay. Nature, Let's... nature is telling us we have to stop. <laughs> yeah, and uh, people wandering around outside looking alarmed, so I, uh, I, better, I better just fall still quickly and then round it off. Okay. Om Paramatma Nenama. Okay. Take care. Thanks. Right, good luck. Thank you. Good luck. Take care, you. Thanks, you everyone. Too.